what time it is. Y'all know what time it is. Y'all know what time it is. Y'all know what time it is. What time it is? What time it is? Hey yeah 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 yeah. Nine eight seven six five four three two one. Let's. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another podcast. Guys, 11,000 subscribers. It's so crazy how far we have come. It used to take me about a month, a month only to gather or to have eight people subscribe to the channel. I remember, I think this was... Something in July 2017 or August 2017. And I was doing eight videos per week. So that means two videos, uh, eight videos per month, two videos per week. And it took me eight videos to gather eight subscribers. And now we've gathered over a thousand subscribers in only approximately two weeks. How crazy is it? I always believed in it. I always knew that this is something that is moving so drastically forward. This is something that has potential. YouTube has potential. I know that uh, from my background, what I was doing, that I have the potential. So I just have to keep grinding and find out what it really takes. So, And I just thought about it. I thought about, well, what does it take to succeed on YouTube or just success in general? I saw one... Uh, the Chris Doe is his name. I really like what he's doing. Uh, he's the kind of guy. He has a YouTube channel and he does stuff. He does uh, YouTube videos or live streams for an audience of four people that is so good. I rewatched it on his YouTube channel. And it has, I think now it's got over a million views. He does such a great performance for only five people. And that's so awesome. And he had a post where he was talking about what it, what does it take to succeed? And I asked myself this question. So I think, what is it to succeed in blank? Kettlebell training, losing weight, uh, getting started with your health and fitness journey, um, discovering, building muscle, keeping muscle, uh, you know, put whatever blank in there. Being a millionaire under 40, I think you have to be relentless, you have to be very strong-minded, you have to be habitually driven to a point where your social surroundings think that you're crazy. <laughs> I truly believe it. And then you don't have to depend on motivation. This is something that we tell our clients on so many occasions. It's not about being motivated. I think so many people get this wrong, even when it comes to kettlebell training or kettlebell are not getting it wrong, just they have a different perspective. I don't like this, just they're wrong. They just have a different perspective. Sometimes people are clearly wrong, but in that case, I think it's, it's, it's a question of how do you look at it? So the way I look at it is, is it's not about being motivated all the time because that's impossible and even Folks think that we coaches or um, trainees or athletes or whatever are so motivated and driven that we do it every day. Every day, No, that's not it. Succeeding depends on habits, building good habits. And I like this analogy that I just came up with because I was thinking about it. I was pondering about this idea and this philosophy, uh, how to succeed. And I came up with this great parable or comparison. Being motivated is like waves in the ocean. Yeah, they can be strong. They can even take the size of a tsunami and they can take over stuff. They can move stuff. They can do stuff. I'd rather be like the current. That's where I think where the habits are. The current is not crazy. The current doesn't move mountains or houses or hills or changes landscapes. The current is just there. But it's so strong that once you get in it, you don't have a chance to get out of it. But it's not spectacular. And that's what habits are. So I compare 
habits to currents and motivation to the waves in the ocean. So it's the same analogy, right? It's the same it's the same situation. It's it's the ocean, but how it functions and how it works is where I believe motivation and habits come together. Doesn't mean that motivation is something that's bad. I think motivation is awesome. It kicks you into gear. It starts the grinding process, but then you have to develop a current because if you just depend on motivation, then you probably stop after two or three weeks. What you have to do is just start grinding, 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 and the grind becomes a habit. And that's why I think success depends on good habits. So here I am digressing. <laughs> I love I love this podcast. You know how I found out that I love what I do right now? Well, I love the workouts. If you just subscribe to the channel for the workouts and kettlebell content, that's awesome. The way I found out how I love to talk and how I love to do things is just I love talking. I love talking. I love to play with my voice. I love to go crazy. I watch a lot of folks who go crazy. I watch a, I watch a lot of entertainment, how they do it. I, I watch a lot of information, how they do it. And here I end up. So, guys, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining. We have a lot of ground to cover. And here I am talking 10 minutes about motivation and success that is not well, it is a little bit kettlebell related, but not 100%. So if you're new to the channel, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Well, you guys, we always talk about that it's free, but it's actually not free because you are investing your time. This is something that you're not getting back. And I highly value and appreciate the fact that you want to invest something with me right now that you won't be getting back. Well, you're getting some value, I hope. But it's time that will be lost, so to speak. It's not you're investing money and you get it in return. It's you're hoping for value that I want to deliver right now. So let's stop the digressing. Guys, we have ground to cover. But before we want to get started, I want to have a word from our sponsors. Stravo, my name is of no importance to you. Just know this. I sponsored today's video of... Lebestank. In the back, you see my friend Igor. We are both hunting for good kettlebell channels. Make sure you like and subscribe to the Lebestark YouTube channel. Or else, comrade, we can't consider you to be a true student of the art of kettlebell training. And so you heard what he said, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I see the chat is already lit. We have the Kettlebell Club in the house. Now, Kettlebell Club, uh, we have Alexia, Rolf, and Dean in the house. Rolf, you're talking about addressing topic of skincare. I will address it. Um, even though I'm not a professional at it, you probably have to ask Angie. She's a woman. She knows how to take care of skin to the max or my mother. Um, I'm just, I think I'm more of a Spartan kind of kind of guy. But uh, I can I can give you my, my tips and, and tricks. But guys, the Kettlebell Club is gathered Kettlebell Club, I got something very special for you. I got something so incredibly special for you. You got it already, but you don't know how to how to access it. And you will access it in a few seconds. So, guys, um, for those of you who are new, we have about 13 people in the chat. So awesome, guys, that you are joining. Um, we have this thing that we call the Kettlebell Club. Now, what is the Kettlebell Club? You find the link in the description. And the Kettlebell Club is something that just formed. It is such an awesome community. It is something that is so incredibly, it is so cool to rock with you guys. I'm so incredibly thankful that you guys are deciding to join in and not only invest your time, but also invest your money. So the Kettlebell Club is our membership of our YouTube channel. You can click the join body you button, you find the link in the description. And what you do is you first of all, financially support our channel. If you think that the value that you're getting is not only worth your time, but it's also worth your money. But then you get some cool perks. Check this out, guys. Whee! <laughs> Club members, this is one of the benefits that you're getting. We got new emojis. Now, hey, I got Alexia Rolf Dean. Guys, please give it a shot. Click on uh, the chat and then click on the emoji. Can you see the new emojis? Can you see the emojis? Check out. I'm just posting right now. Do you see it, chat? Check it out, chat. I'm, ch I'm posting Gypsy. How he's saying, let's go. So we got this awesome emojis, guys. You got to hit it in the chat right now. So uh, new emojis. It's only for Kettlebell Club members. Even the Kettlebell. You know, always people talk about it and they say, well, 
You know what's missing in Emojipedia? It is missing a kettlebell. So here we are. We got a kettlebell for you guys. We got the double biceps flex pose for myself. We got Grüezi Mitterrand, the formal greeting in Switzerland, which we always say Grüezi Mitterrand. Then you have Angie's awesome pose, and you got Gypsy saying, let's go. Guys, you can use these emojis. And then you have uh, the second benefits that you're getting is, as you can see right here, and I hope you're seeing it clearly right now, and uh, Alexia, you're already trying it out. Uh, love the gypsy one. <laughs> so awesome. Uh, this is my tip. I glue. Ah, awesome. Climb on wax. Uh, got it, Rolf. And you're choosing the Kettlebell LS logo. It's awesome, right? It's awesome. I will uh, come back to this statement uh, later, Rolf. Uh, what I'm seeing right now in the chat that is you're not seeing the picture correctly right now. I hope this doesn't bother you. I'm seeing that something technical because I changed something. But we will get to uh, to this. Now, um, amazing emojis, right, Dean? <laughs> It's just cool. Now, what you also get now, you don't see it right now as good in the chat, but you also get an awesome Ellis logo next to your name whenever you comment something. So this shows that you belong to the tribe. And what you have is when you join the club, is this awesome community vibe. Guys, let me tell you, we have awesome folks in our club. We have Dean, we have Alexia, we have the club leader, um, long toe. We have Stefan. We have so many cool folks right now in the club, and it's a very understanding and very welcoming community. So if you just discovered the kettlebell, think about it. Join the club and get some tribalism feeling. It's just awesome. Now, subscribe and like the video if you're into kettlebells because we're about all things kettlebells. So you're on the right spot. Now, Q and A's. It's all about the Q and A's, guys. So if you have a question, please ask it in the chat. You can ask the question right now in the chat and I will get back to you. Or uh, you can ask the question later if you watch the stream and then you see what we talk about and maybe you have an input, something that you want to share. And then just ask the question and I will check out the chat once in a while. And we have a designated section at the end where we will take a look if we have anything uh, worthwhile talking about in the live chat and take a look if it is, if it is lit. We have uh, 12 people in the chat. Thank you so much for joining, guys. Let's rock this. Now. This is the first thing that I want to talk about. It's not directly kettlebell related. And at the same time, it is something that I believe, let's let's switch the window. I want to see, I, I want you guys to see it a little bit better. Um, I'm gonna switch it up right now for you guys because I want you to see this um, so that it looks a little bit better. I want you to see everything. Now, guys, um, it is it is a very interesting topic when it comes to uh, obesity and health. And the current discussion right now goes into a direction that I think is not the truth. So Cos what Cosmopolitan is doing right here is they're lying to you. Now, when we talk about obesity or we talk about, you know, when you're overweight, if you're overweight, if you are obese, this has nothing to do with your personality. You are just as worthy in the eyes of our creator as I am. So we are both on the... Hey, somebody just joined the Kettlebell Club. Thank you so much. <laughs> somebody just decided, hey, I got to rock this. I got to join the Kettlebell Club. Welcome. Now, um, to get back to the topic, you are just as worthy as I am as a person. This has nothing to do with personality. What it has to do with is being true and being truthful. Telling an obese person that it is healthy is dangerous. When you look at the science right now, scientifically speaking, people are saying that obesity can lead to serious health problems. And there are metabolically healthy obese people, meta metabolically healthy overweight folks. Yes, it does exist. And there are even people who are overweight who are strong and fit. It does exist. Take a look at how what strong men's are like. Strong men's are sometimes really obese and overweight, yet they're pretty strong. It doesn't take away from the fact if you carry excessive fat with you that it can lead to serious health 
problems. So if we walk around and tell folks that obesity, being obese is healthy, this sends the wrong message because it has nothing to do with personality. It has to do with the, with the situation in itself. So what Nick Mitchell is saying right here, uh, I follow him because he's the, the CEO of Ultimate Performance. And we want to check out what he said in uh, this section. I want to read you what he was saying because I think it is interesting. Now, Ultimate Performance is one of the leading personal training studios ever. They have multiple gyms and what he does is he's so successful in what he does that he's probably ranked worldwide one of the best and, and, and most successful personal trainers because he has Hey, somebody just donated. Hey, what's going on, guys? You're going crazy. Hey, you bring me out of my concept. I got, I got to focus. Thank you for the donation. We'll come back to it. Now, what, uh, what Nick Mitchell is saying, I'm going to paraphrase. I want to read it to you. Now, he's saying, no, it's really not healthy. Maybe they're young enough to not be feeling the ill effects of obesity yet. Now, what he says is, there, what experts do agree on is that there are people who are healthy, in terms of their metabolism and their uh, values, or, or uh, the blood, you know, blood work and all that kind of stuff. So yet they're healthy. Yet there is probably a grace period where your body doesn't feel the effects yet. And what you do is you, when you're morbidly obese, like this woman in the picture, what you do is you probably increase the chances that you will develop some serious illnesses and this is where my heart is we want to help people who have a little bit of a struggle with diet and exercise because i struggle with other things in other areas where i'm grateful if other people have a spot in their heart for me where i need help so this is where i'm burning for folks who, 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 who want to discover the kettlebell discover some make better decisions in in, in their nutrition and, and and training so i'm there for these people but if we sent the message that it's healthy it's dangerous so what he says says is this is awful as it's literally celebrating poor health that lifestyle interventions can change search full balance if you swipe left you'll see that images three and four are not usual cover model look but they're not obese and especially as they are female, male, they're much more likely than men to be healthy despite carrying a bit more fat than is often described as being optimal for health. Now, when you look at these ladies right here, that's totally fine. That's totally fine. And what he says is conflating obese individuals with a couple of women who are bigger than the standard female model is sneaky mind game level of BS. They are trying to tell you that being comfortable with your appearance Something I support 100%. I do support it as well. If you're comfortable with how you look, that's awesome. I'm 100% for you. It also means your body is somehow magically healthy despite every single piece of scientific evidence clearly pointing towards the fact that obesity is directly correlated with all-cause mortality. So if you feel fine in your skin, that's awesome. I support you. At the same time, if you ask me and you're morbidly obese, is it healthy? It's probably not. It's probably something that you might want to change. However, I do believe that you have a God-given right not to change. If you don't want to change, that's, that's okay because it's your decision. If we look at it from society, from a perspective of society, if people don't want to change, yet probably lifestyle interventions would improve their health, we could say if people would make the decision to improve their health, society could benefit from it. Yet on a personal level, I do believe you have a God-given right not to change. And what he says, push back on this. It's aimed at selling magazines and getting clicks, not helping people. And that's what's up. It's all about the clicks. It's all about selling stuff, getting views, getting the clicks. Because now I'm talking about it. Now you see the cover of Cosmopolitan and probably you check it out. It's just the same with everything. Now this press, this is something that I feel cosmopolitan, you're doing your readers a disservice because you lie to them. This is not healthy. Let's keep going. Um, I recently thought about this. 
Education, experience, confidence, and experience. So how do these four nouns work together when it comes to kettlebell training? I believe the first thing that you probably need when it comes to learning how to work with the kettlebell is education. It's one of the first things that you probably need. So educate yourself. Talk to a coach. Follow somebody who can prove that he or she has a track record in helping people. That's one thing. So they are doing fine. They are very well equipped in teaching other people. That's one thing that you should look out for. They know how to tell you the stuff so that you learn it. And the second thing is the track record of they are represented by an institution or they took a course or they learned from an inst institution which is an authority. So this is how you can educate yourself. I was talking to a client recently and she said, and I'm reading when it comes to nutrition now, uh, I'm, she says, I'm reading so much stuff about nutrition and it's just, it's confusing. And everybody's saying something different. And what I always say and what even experts say is it depends on who you are listening to and who you surround yourself with. If you're at the bottom of the pyramid, and this is not, I, I don't want to say it in a negative way, but if you're at the bottom where everybody has, everybody has an opinion that is mostly people have sometimes uninformed mis or misinformed uh, or what's the third? Uninformed, misinformed, or an illogical opinion, then everybody else, everybody says something different. Yet, when you go to the top of the pyramid and you improve the level or you improve your surroundings that you choose to listen to when it comes to education, doesn't matter the topic, you improve the quality, then mostly experts tend to say the same depending on who you who you're listening to but experts tend to have a like-minded idea or like-minded um, philosophy doesn't mean that there are differences but it's more like-minded right so for what I'm, what I'm trying to say is if you listen to what I'm saying and then you listen to what Steve Carter is saying. We tend to say the same things because I got it from him. Yet some things I have, in my opinion, improved upon or I have changed. So maybe I disagree on some things with Steve. However, we are very like-minded. So that's one of the first things that you get is educate yourself. You can do it through a coach or through videos, yet we always say the same. We want to advise you to talk to a good coach who can really help you. Now, once you got that education, now you need some experience. You start, you have to start working with stuff. So you, you were taught some techniques or you were taught some basics. And now you want to work those basics, work those techniques to make it habitual, to build a habit, a good habit, so you can improve the technique because once your movements are stored in the cerebellum and they become more habitual, your brain needs less energy to, to work the technique, to trigger all the muscles, neuromuscular aspects, and you get stronger, all that kind of stuff that you're probably familiar with. So experience means you build upon the technique that you were taught. That's why it's so important you have to listen to what you were teaching or what you've been taught because if you build experience on something that is not the best way to go or that is maybe wrong, then you have to use additional energy to reprogram the cerebellum to really change the stuff that was probably not as good for you or not as good in the sense of the technique or exercise or whatever. So once you got the education, you start building experience, then you get more confident. So confidence starts to settle in once you feel well-equipped with the kettlebell. And not only well-equipped with the kettlebell itself, just well-equipped with whatever you're trying to build your expectations expertise in that's when you're a coach or whatever you're trying to build or whatever you you're passionate about so you build more confidence once you have gained more experience and this leads to you experimenting with the stuff that you got
because you're educated the right way, you have a lot of experience, you build a lot of confidence, and now you try experimenting. That's, and I can tell you this from a personal point of view, from my perspective, it is because I listen to what people are saying, and we will talk about it later in a comment that I got. Um, I listen to what people are saying. I listen, for example, you saw me referencing Nick Mitchell before. I do listen to what Nick Mitchell is saying because I think he's an expert in the area of personal training. And since I'm in that business and that genre as well, um, I listen to what the best in my genre are, say, are saying because they got to this point not for no reason. However, there are certain things that Nick Mitchell is sharing that I disagree with and certain things that I even sometimes ask myself, why is he sharing this on social? Yet it is his decision. So he's, at least he stands by it. And I've gained so much confidence in the, in, in, in the last, let's say like in the last 12 months, that now I can safely disagree with even, let's say, like experts on the field that have more experience than I have, yet I still am so confident with the way I do it. I see results the way I do it. I see potential in the way I do it that I can safely disagree and say, well, I have a different perspective. Whereas before, I was always a little bit shaken. If I heard something that I was, I don't think that's quite what I believe as my identity. Precision Nutrition says it is your identity as a coach or as a trainee. And then somebody else said something that shook me. And then I was like, oh, I have to adjust. And now I'm like, well, I'm listening. But I'm entertaining the thought. I'm entertaining what was expressed in my brain. I'm thinking about it, pondering, it, pondering about it. And just because I entertain a thought doesn't mean that I automatically accept it. Now let's keep going. We're talking about the origins of uh, kettlebells. And this, guys, this is so interesting. I want to read this to you. I got this comment on my YouTube channel, on the YouTube channel. So I was like, we always say that the origins of the kettlebell is Russia, right? So we think it's from Russia. So after getting this comment that I'm going to read to you in a second, I had to do some research, come to find out it's probably not Russia only. And uh, my research showed it, I got one article that I'm going to follow up from Barbend and uh, something that I found by myself that I'm going to show uh, to you now, but now let's read the comment check it out guys uh, while we often look to Russia as the home of the kettlebell its origin or at least a variant seems to go back to classical Greece with the haltere yeah haltere were the first dumbbells so to speak that were developed in Greece there is even evidence and, but I didn't know that you can say that a kettlebell can be traced back even back to this area or to this age there is even evidence of a similar apparatus used in a similar way, swings, feats of strength, in China and Scotland. Wow. Interestingly enough, the popularity of the kettlebell and kettlebell sport in Russia may be thanks to the Germans, as kettlebells were being used there for athletics, circus performers, and strongmen, including the Turner, the Turner system. And Theodore Siebert. So I did some research on this dude, Theodore Siebert. And wow, it's crazy. It seems it was there that Dr. Krajewski really learned the value of the kettlebell and brought it back to Russia to use for the army and athletic benefits. And because Dr. Krajewski brought it back to the army and for athletic benefits, that's where its popularity grew in Russia and that's where kettlebell sport then came from. So it is interesting that while the kettlebell has been a part of Russian folk culture for a few hundred years, because it was a scale weight, it didn't become mainstream and an official sport until 1948. And we can even say it was 1960 that the first championship was formed, or the first institution. Even here, the kettlebell sport institution, even here in the United States, the kettlebell was used in the late 1800s. What? Early 1900s, before this appearing mid-century. Now, this I didn't did my research on, but I did some research on Theodore Siebert. 
I learned of the kettlebell from Pavel, and while it was several years before I could afford the bell and start training, I'm very thankful to men like him, Steve Cotter, for popularizing it and making instructions from book and then video possible. Yeah, and I got the kettlebell from Steve Cotter, so that's the reason why I'm abiding him. Wow. Now, I want to read you this article, which I think is also interesting. It says, from, uh, from Russia with love, and it's a barband article. So, it goes like this. Usually, it's modern popularity. It's, uh, the, uh, sorry? Usually, uh, the popularity from the kettlebell gets traced to Russia, where it's called the Giro Ogiria. The term first appeared in Russia dictionaries in 1704 and originates from the Persian word Girani, meaning this difficult. Wow. It's also been traced to the ancient Slavic word gur, which means bubble. <laughs> so cool. The story goes that Russian farmers used kettlebells as counterweights to measure outgrain in the market. As both farmers learned the weights could be heaved and tossed in feats of strength and endurance, Kiros became, uh, began enjoying a central role in farming festivals. Sometime around the turn of the 19th century, a Russian doctor called Vladislav Krajewski realized that the kettlebell deserved a place in sports medicine. Krajewski, also called von Krajewski, um, happened to be the personal physician of the Russian Tsar, oof, who popularized kettlebell training in the Russian army, as we just read before, which eventually elevated it to a national sport. But that's not the whole story. As historians unearth more and more documents, some of which can be found in archives like those at the Stark Center in Austin and the Open Source Physical Culture Library, and I got some stuff from the Stark Center, uh, I think it's Stark Center ROG, it has become clear that kettlebells had a presence in more places than Russia. There are photographs, and I checked this, that's awesome. There are photographs of strong women and men prior to the 1900s who used kettlebells in feats like the bent arm press and extended lateral isometric holds. Pointing to an old image of a strong woman, Elise Serafin, Lufman, I didn't even know there were strong women back then. And, not, and of course there were strong women, but the strong women in the sense of like strong men doing uh, uh, feats of strength. Importantly, here it comes, many of these old images came out of Germany, which has a large, unrecognized history of using the tool. There's even evidence that it was the first place or one of the first places where the kettlebell was used as a part of physical fitness culture. Whoa! The kettlebell isn't purely Russian at all. Wow. And here we see that Dr. Krajewski, he met... Theodore Siebert, and he saw, according to these records, how he lifted with the kettlebell because he was doing some strongman stuff. Then he took the kettlebell back to Russia, and then that's where the popularity grew. So origins of the kettlebell, it's not only Russia, it's Germany probably as well. How interesting. Now, let's check out what's going on, guys. We have 14 people in the chat. Thank you so much for joining, guys. Let's check out what's going on. Uh, we want to just uh, switch back just for a second and see if we got anything uh, that we can help you with before we dive into the questions and the comments on YouTube. Now, guys, yeah, you, the Kettlebell Club is discovering. <laughs> the Kettlebell Club is discovering those awesome, uh, awesome emojis. How cool! And um, Rolf saying, uh, when it comes to skincare, he says, "This is my tip." I glue 120 grit sandpaper on a lollipop stick to file uh, to file down the hard skin. Climb on wax. Are you really doing this? Um, because I think what I just do is I let it heal and I use some cream. I'm going to show it to you. Oh, just some basic stuff, guys. What I do is uh, I just use a basic cream. And what I believe skincare, when it comes to kettlebell training, what is more important, my opinion, than caring for your skin after training with the kettlebell is how you structure your program or your exercises following some tears in your skin. Because now, we were doing snatches yesterday and I was snatching with a 28 kilo and unfortunately I just ripped some of my skin. Even though I got some calluses now, sometimes it still rips. And I always point it back to the fact that my technique just has to become better. Or maybe it's about the handle. I can't, I can't just put it perfectly. However, I believe once your technique 
is is perfected then your skin won't be uh won't won't look as bad as 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 maybe let's say like before when i was snatching the first time with the 28 my skin was looking way worse so the idea now is we have another live workout coming up tomorrow so what is my idea in programming this workout after knowing that my skin took a little bit little bit of a beating the idea is now to watch how my exercise selection looks like so i'm not gonna do snatches I'm not going to do, maybe not going to do swings. We're going to do some grinding lifts where I have to rack the kettlebell or work with the kettlebell and not jump around between the finger grip or the hook grip. Just let it in the hook grip. For example, maybe we're doing a strict press. Maybe we're doing a squat. Maybe we're doing deadlifts. Just some basic grinding lifts to let the skin heal. Heal. And when it comes to snatches itself, this is something that I got from Steve Carter. He said... Don't snatch twice or three times per week with very heavy weight. This can be seriously damaging not only for your skin, but it com- maybe it can become uh, um, uh, chronic um, over over time because then maybe your skin doesn't even repair at all or or maybe you just get some calluses or maybe some cuts that are so deep that maybe you just have to stop working out for a longer time so it's all about knowing how to uh, it's all about programming and structuring your workout so i hope that answers some of your questions but i think it's a great idea rolf Uh, thank you so much for the inputs now we got Alexia. You missed the kilograms so that we can use them during the workouts, Alexia. <laughs> you know why I didn't put a kilogram number on this? Because if somebody wants to steal that kettlebell, you know what? It got the LSO go on it. So, hey, you can't steal it. <laughs> Sebastian Son, welcome to the Kettlebell Club. So awesome that you're joining. And Rolf, thank you so much for the donation. Twenty. What's the currency in Norway? Let me know. Uh, Alexa saying, in this regard, I have to say that I'm not happy with my body. I still have a lot of complexes and was bullied at school and secondary school because of my weight. Years later, I discovered the benefits of sport. And now I know a lot of women who are complaining about their weight and bodies, but they don't want to do anything about it. And what is worse, they promote obesity on being big. I'm very grateful to have changed my habits on time. So this is what we actually want to talk about and want to focus on. If we tell people that being obese is okay we keep perpetuating the notion that people maybe don't feel as well in their body and yet science or not science and yet media tells them hey it's okay it's all right don't have to worry about it so maybe you stop worrying about it even though your body or your signals are telling that something's maybe a little bit off and sometimes this can go into the extreme that sometimes you don't feel confident at all no matter how you look this can be the extreme Yet I believe if we listen to our bodies and we fine tune in and we don't cheat ourselves, maybe our body is telling us that something may be wrong or maybe not perfect. And science science is saying that health problems do come up if if we don't do something about obesity. So what I really love about what you did, Alexia, is you changed your habits. Yet it doesn't justify the fact that you're supposed to get bullied at school. I do understand that this is not a cool feeling. I got bullied at school in some other area as well. And it's not cool. However, what we do about it, maybe when we grow a little bit older, is what really counts. So, great inputs there, Alexia. Dean saying, have the jerk snatches and long cycle been the form of, for kettlebell sport for a long time? Well, I do believe yes. I do believe um, when it comes to, I think the first championship was held and formed, the institution was 1960. And I think probably that's when the snatch, the jerk and the long cycle became the staple exercises. Yet, you know, while I believe that using the law of exercise and working these exercises as much as possible is good, and we do believe in the basics and we do believe that forming a good technique and habit takes time and needs thousands and thousands of reps. What I also heard from Denis Vasiliev is, is that sometimes athletes get a burnout. They get a burnout on the jerk, burnout on the snatch, and then they don't improve and they don't become better. 
And then what Dennis's advice is, is then switch up your exercise or workout or training uh, uh, regime so that you can maybe uh, take some time off this particular exercise. And then when you come back, it's maybe better. And this is something that we're seeing with clients as well. It happens. People, when they start learning the exercise, sometimes they hit a plateau. It doesn't get better. And sometimes it even gets worse. So it's that small dip or that small bump, right? And then we switch the exercise. We don't, we stop doing uh, swings. We stop doing cleans or whatever have you, doing different exercises. And then we come back to the exercise, let's say like two or three weeks later, and the swing has improved. This is something that we also experience. It's like learning a language. It goes fast, then it hits a plateau, then here comes the bump, and then you have to stay grinding, stay working on it. This is where the rubber meets the road because most people or a lot of people fall, you know, they, they fall away from it because they experience, well, I've been working so long and now it looks worse. This happens. You just have to keep grinding, 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 and boom, all of a sudden the bump will be along the road and you will get better. And we had this. Alexia, you mentioned this, how Jose is now able to do a overhead squat, right? It was an overhead squat with uh, where he's really stable. And this takes time. And we didn't do overhead squats many times, yet probably now he built some strength and built some mobility where he's now able to do it, which is so awesome. Oh, we got 21 people in the chat. Oh, what's up? Chat slid, guys. Yeah. So, um, sweet emojis, long toe. Nice. They're cool. You guys are using it. <laughs> I really love it. Uh, Dean's saying it'd be interesting to see squat events for competition too. Ooh, yeah. The labor squat, especially. Now, can you see Angie just joined the jet and she got, she's blue and she got that small wrench. So that means she's now a moderator. And baby, are you able to use the, the, um, the emojis? You should be able to use them now. And, uh, Ah, Kronen, Kronen, Rolf. Yeah, that's the currency. So let's move on, guys, and let's uh, switch it back. But before, another word from our sponsor. Stravo, my name is of no importance to you. Just know this. I sponsored today's video of Liebestag. In the back, you see my friend Igor. We are both hunting for good kettlebell channels. Make sure you like and subscribe to the Lebestark YouTube channel. Or else, comrade, we can't consider you to be a true student of the art of kettlebell training. As you heard, guys, like the video and subscribe to the channel. Now, we were talking about it before. We were talking about um, education, experience, confidence and experiments right so i got this comment where i want to apply this thinking or this philosophy that i just shared a few minutes ago in this comment so uh, somebody said two things you should maybe improve since i also follow stephen pavel and really appreciate the little details they mentioned he says at a certain number we're going to take a look at the video but first we're going to talk about the comment you could actually use way more your hips and legs Maybe it's a slow motion, but when you watch Steve and Pavel doing the swing, for example, they are extremely explosive in the hips and legs. And then at 0246, this looks a bit painful for the lower back. Anyway, I hope it's okay to give some critics and keep on. Cheers. And guys, this is very important. I'm always open to criticism. If you see something on our videos where you think you can criticize it or you ask a question because you're not familiar with it, do it. Because I have... I, I have had other comments where somebody was asking about my rack position and he clearly pointed out a flaw where I had to say, well, back then I didn't know it better. Now I know better and I improved and now take a look at my technique. Now I think I have improved and you're right. I should have done it like this back then. You understand what I'm saying? So critics are always there sometimes to help you. And this person even subscribed to the channel. So thank you very much for the comment if you're just watching or you see it on demand. Now let's check out what he's saying. Now first of all, he says two things where we can apply this philosophy. He says, listen, I follow X and X, blank, blank. You can put in Steve, Pavel, put whatever name you want. You can even say, I follow Leberstock, I follow Gregory, I follow Angie, and then I follow Swing This Kettlebell and Strength, and then I follow Caveman Train. You can mention whoever name you want to. So what I 
what I always think about is, yes, Stephen Pavel, two legendary icons in the field. What they do, like I said before, I listen. However, I have my own style. I've gained my confidence and I'm experimenting with my style. And just because Steve and Pavel are doing something doesn't mean that I have to automatically do it. If you see me do something, doesn't mean that you have, have to automatically emulate the style that I'm doing. Maybe you take something out of it and the rest you leave away because I think, well, for my physique or for my anthrop anthropometrics or whatever, it doesn't work. Now let's check out what he's saying. Now in... Uh, in this comment or in this uh, section, and I, I always love, I always love watching ads on my, <laughs> on my videos. <laughs> so he says right here, he says I could use more of the hips. Now it is a slow motion that you're seeing, right? That's why it maybe doesn't look as explosive, yet I'm using a lot of my hips. I'm using 90% of my hips in this, in this clean. Yet, however, I do not use my hips explosively for multiple reasons. Now, first of all, like I said, I've developed my own style. Second of all, I don't use explosiveness. I, use, I, I train in the kettlebell sports style, which is all about efficiency. So when I go into the backswing, doesn't matter if I do the swing, the clean, or the snatch. What I now newly developed is I try to straighten my legs to get, when the kettlebell is in the backswing, my knees are almost straight, my legs are almost straight, just bent maybe to a small little degree, and then I feel a pretty strong stretch in my glutes and my hamstrings. So what happens is as soon as I go back, kettlebelting to kettlebell, back into the horizontal plane forward using my hips, what happens is I use that so-called stretch reflex. When you use the power of a stretch reflex, what is a stretch reflex? If you stretch a muscle and then immediately contract it afterwards, this, there, there's a stretch reflex that starts developing and this stretch reflex sets or creates additional energy that is released if you immediately contract a muscle after it is stretched. So I'm using that powerful stretch reflex that allows me to work more efficiently so I don't have to use explosiveness to kettlebell to kettlebell, catapult to kettlebell forward. That's one thing. Now, and the second thing that I want to mention is just because Steven Pavel is working explosively in the hips doesn't mean that I have to work as explosively. Because when we look at science, and I'm not a professional in that field because this is strength training and you have to probably ask a strength coach. But from my knowledge, what I know is training for explosiveness or doing a, doing a exercise more explosive doesn't automatically translate in explosive strength if you could even put a a you know your thumb or your finger on explosive strength you know so science is not clear about this and then maybe the last point is i don't need explosive strength so i don't do it like this i look how to do it but it's different. And, you know, Steve is more the kettlebell sports style, but Pavel is heart style, so it's completely different. And let's check out what he says in uh, 246. He's saying that it maybe looks a little painful for the back. And we're going to check it out right now. And here I'm dropping the kettlebell. I have to move a little bit back. Now let's go a little bit slower that you guys are seeing it Uh uh, playback speed here you go so now uh, what happened here we got this is the final seconds of a goblet squat exercise where we did two minutes with the goblet squat I was rocking a 32 kilo kettlebell 32 kilogram kettlebell so I got back up resting back up so here maybe my back is a little bit bent but that's totally fine and now I'm dropping it I'm flipping the kettlebell forward now what happens now what happens is the weight drops into my hips. My hips are taking the brunt of the weight and then my back bends a little bit. Totally fine. Totally fine. No worries about my back. Would I advise you to do the same thing with a 32 kilogram kettlebell if you're just starting out and it's your first goblet squat and now you want to drop it? No. 
However, if you're a little bit safer, if your back is not perfectly straight, although I think in my case it was pretty good, but maybe a little bit bent, then it's okay, right? So I love these, you know, and I love to talk about these things because sometimes I learn something from these uh, cases and sometimes we can all learn from this, right? So let's keep going. Does kettlebell improve mild scoliosis? Now, I'm not a physiotherapist. I'm not a doctor. So I'm, I'm just, when it comes to these kind of questions, I'm very, very uh, hesitant. Yet what I can say, we had experience from one of our clients that she had a, a pretty, a strong case. We have actually two cases. We have one case, she has severe case of scoliosis. Lower back, chest, neck, it's crazy. And she showed me x-rays on when she was born when they had to uh, really um, do some surgery to improve the scoliosis because it was so bad. And she is doing fine. She has reduced her, veins, uh, her pain subjectively on a very, very high level. And she got really, really good with the kettlebell. In her case, I cannot say that it improved the positioning of the spine. I cannot say this. However, it helped her tremendously, the kettlebell. What I can say from another case is that they were actually, and I, you know, I, I can't, I'm paraphrasing because this conversation happened a long time ago. But when she went to therapy after training with us for eight weeks, three times per week, the therapist looked at her and he was amazed because he said, wow, things have changed on a very high level. So I can't even remember how he uh, measured it, but as far as I can say, paraphrasing, of course, is her scoliosis improved drastically. And it was even, there was even a, a, a measurement that you can put on it. Does it mean that everybody will see an improvement in scoliosis? I can't say. I don't have a lot of experience. In that case, we're not physiotherapists. We don't do training uh, when it comes to cases that are pretty severe, just with cases who are healthy, maybe have the, like uh, that other client who has a more severe case of scoliosis, but she can train. So wouldn't take it at face value that everybody will improve mild scoliosis, but you probably just improve pain and, and, and you will get stronger in so many areas which are so, so needed in today's day and age. Doesn't matter if you have a scoliosis or not, the glutes and, and just the core and in general. Have you had clients who had headaches after doing overhead movements like snatches? No, we haven't. However, what I believe what this person might be saying is if you drop the kettlebell from the overhead top fixation down, leaning back, corkscrew, kettlebell drops, amortization, woo, kettlebell flies down. What may happen if you're not applying the right technique is that once the kettlebell drops into the backswing, you lean forward pretty heavily. If you don't use counterweight, if you don't use your upper body to, um, to counterweight, to as counterweight to, oh man, sometimes I lose these words, to compensate, now I got it, to compensate for the gravitational pull, then gravity will pull you down even harder and even stronger. So you're leaning forward, your, your, your lean forward will probably be very, very high in degree, if you can follow me. And then you come back up. So what happens is maybe your head goes below your heart and then your head goes back up and then it's above the heart. And then it goes down, so your head is below your heart. And then this can be tricky for your brain when it comes to the blood flow. This is something that we experienced in another exercise. So this may happen. That's why you have to make sure that you compensate for the gravity pull when you drop the kettlebell. And the second thing is don't lean forward too much. We even started, and I, I was talking uh, with Angie about this. Uh, when we were looking at older videos of our form, when I was doing a snatch or a swing and... and the, the form is, you know, when I compare it to now, it looks terrible. <laughs> it looks terrible. And it's just like it's maybe a year ago. It's so incredibly how I was able and how we were able to improve the technique because we're working so often with it, applying the right information. And that's when uh, 
I'm going to the swing or to the snatch and my upper body leans forward so drastically. And we even had a client, she said, it wasn't a snatch, but she said, sometimes I get a little bit dizzy. So that's maybe it. Kettlebell Kings has an adjustable competition style that seems legit. Any chance you might review it? Well, if Kettlebell Kings provides one, I will, I will gladly review it. However, I have one experience, not with a kettlebell, but I have experience with adjustable dumbbells, the Bowflex. And if you compare the Bowflex to the standard dumbbells, they're not cool. Because of its size, they're very large size. Even if you use just very small weights, five kilo, you still pick up that very long, long piece. There are other uh, dumbbells as well that are adjustable, that are different. And what I, saw, uh, what I know is from, a, from experience, I'm working with a client who has adjustable dumbbells. Sometimes when you rack them and then you're trying to switch weights, then it, it was broken once. So we had to repair it. And I don't know what it is when it comes to a, a adjustable kettlebell. And the second question that you maybe ask yourself is, do I need one? Because most men, I would say now, men will work with a 16 to 24 kilo as evergreen weights. That's my opinion. And most women will work with 12 to 20 kilos as evergreen weights. Or just 12 and 16. 20 is pretty heavy, so that's more like for athletes or folks who are pretty, uh, women who are pretty strong. But let's say like 12 and 16 will be evergreens for women. And let's say like 20 and 24 will be evergreens for weight uh, for men. Why then choose an adjustable competition kettlebell if you can just say, well, I'm just buying two kettlebells once I'm getting a little bit stronger. And hey, having a, a cool kettlebell collection is worth the look, isn't it? Because it looks cool if you have uh, a nice collection of kettlebells. Let's keep going. Uh, are you guys doing these live workouts on the same day each week and same time? I want to join soon. Nice work, both of you. Thank you very much. Um, we're doing these live workouts right now on a almost daily basis because like every other country in the world, we are experiencing a lockdown light. Where, well, now we, we actually experience a hardcore lockdown. We have to be closed. Um, that's why we do kettlebell workouts outside. But we also have to close at 7 p.m. So that's the reason why Angie and I decided, you know, you know what? We're going to stream almost every day. So uh, if you just hang around the channel, check out when we have our next uh, kettlebell workout live. The next one's tomorrow at 7 p.m. and join. And the ones that are always uh, the one kettlebell workout that I can guarantee you no matter what happens if we open up back again if everything's back to normal one workout that we will always follow is the Saturday workout at 12 p.m. Central Eastern Standard Time this is always the safe one the safe bet now why are you doing this little stop during the movement is there any way to calculate the carry, uh, calories that we burn during the program um, calorie burn is something that is our I can't put an, I, I won't, let's, set it like, let's put it like this. I won't put an arbitrary number on a calorie burn that you get. I just won't do it because you can't say it. You can't say 100% that you will burn as much calories and this other person will burn this much calories. What we can say from scientific studies is if you train 30 minutes high intensity, it's probably like say like between 200 and 400 calories. If you do the one hour workout that Angie and me were doing the marathon where you work out for one hour straight, I believe we burn let's say like five to 600 calories. Angie probably a little bit less because she's lighter in weight. So that's hard to say. And doing stop and doing these little stop movements or stops during the movement is to work as efficiently as possible with the kettlebell. For example, if I have a heavy kettlebell or we do goblet squats, then I always try to go down into the rack or in the squat rest position where I can breathe because my idea is we work for time. So what I want to do is if I do a goblet squat for two minutes straight, I don't want to put the kettlebell down. I don't want to have to put it down. I just want to rest during the work or during those two minutes. And then maybe I rest a little shorter, rest a little longer. That's why we do these stops, right? So we, st we still have 13 people in the chat, guys. Thank you so much for joining. It's so awesome, guys. So awesome. So awesome. Let's keep going. We have uh, a few more comments. 
Now this question, but guys, hey, before before I answer this question, because I want to finish this, we have one, two, three, four, five, six questions. But I, man, I I I just gotta I I, I gotta hit the toilet for a few seconds, all right? So I'm a, I'm gonna be right back. I'm gonna be right back, guys. Hey, 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 guys, I see that, you're <laughs> that you guys are having a conversation in the chat. That's awesome. <laughs> Let's check out. I just want to I just want to uh, take a brief look at the chat. 11 people still rocking with us. Thank you so much for joining, guys. Now, what I want to say or take a look at what Rolf is saying. He says, I try to copy Angie style and kilogram, but she's too much in the background in the videos and I don't use glasses when I train. Well, if you know what, I'm, I'm always, guys, we got to have a petition to motivate and push Angie to get more in front of the camera. Because, you know, I, I'm just, I'm so rowdy. I always go crazy, balls to the walls, going to the extreme. So we have to motivate and push Angie that she has to go more in front of the camera. Please, please guys, Kettlebell Club, let her know in the chat that Angie's welcome right in front of the camera, that she has to do some pushing and some grinding and some rowdying. Not only me. <laughs> Thank you so much for saying this. Rolf. Now, Angie, you're not, you're not seeing the, baby, you're not seeing the emojis. We got to check out uh, how we can implement this. Now, um, King Kong saying, I get a trapped nerve sometimes days after training. That's interesting. If you can trace it back, King Kong, can you trace it back to what exercise you're doing? What I would do is just evaluate the exercise that I'm doing. And if the same exercise is stressing out some of your nerves or some of your muscles or causing some spasm or whatever, then maybe leave that exercise out. Maybe you're doing the exercise the way your body does not respond to very well. This happens because anthrop anthropometrically speaking, some people have trouble with certain variations of exercises because their, their, their body is not made for that exercise and maybe they have to do a variation. So I would trace back what exercise causes the nerves to go nuts. All right, <laughs> to go nuts. <laughs> Now, uh, Captain Howdy is saying, so how is everyone? And Alexia is saying, tired of having my daughter nonstop for the whole afternoon. And you know what Captain's saying? He says, ah, don't worry. Eventually they move out. <laughs> yes, they do, right? <laughs> so uh, you guys are having an awesome conversation, man. I, I love this. I love this. I love this. 
Um, I'm goofing off on the job. I just wanted to catch a live stream. So awesome. Thank you so much for joining, Captain Howdy. And uh, 15 years for that to happen, Alexi. All right. Which, <laughs> it takes some more time for your daughter to move out, right? <laughs> and Captain Howdy, same. I'm a new... You're, you're just starting out with kettlebells. So that's... that's. I think that you're at the right spot right now, my friend. And uh, yeah. Come on, Angie D. Give us some love. That's what up. Didn't expect you to read these, Captain Audi. Well, I do read the chat. I do I do read almost everything that we get in the chat. And we love it when people have this conversation. So I hope you're feeling well, welcome. So let's get back to the uh, to the to the comments, guys. And let's see what's up. Now, um, this question, why do you lift your heel off the ground when you snatch a 16 kilogram kettlebell? What I want to advise you is check out the video that we did on the snatch. We did two very, on the on. I think the, the recent live stream, I think it was eight. I was even live stream, I'm sorry, podcast number eight. This is where we methodically um, picked apart the snatch in every, with every phase. Because when it comes to these ballistic exercises, we believe that you can extrapolate the exercise best if you choose a, a method that really picks it apart into phases. So we believe the snatch has nine phases. Now, we have the podcast in itself and we have two videos where I'm reacting to the snatch to give you a, reacting to my snatch and to my technique to give you a rundown. And then we also have the video where I'm talking about the snatch itself in its nine phases. I think it's a 17 minute video, but if you're really having questions where you wanna go deep when it comes to the snatch, please check it out. Now, just to briefly answer this question, why do I lift my heel? heel off the ground um, I do it because once the kettlebell once I put the kettlebell let's start let's start from the uh, from the bottom I get the kettlebell in the in the backswing and then I bring it up now what I do is I use my hip as an aim so when I go on my let's say like I'm, I'm snatching with the right hand then I'm going on the lifting my right heel off the floor going on my right toes using the hip as a aim so i want to aim the hip at the top that's one idea the second reason why i'm doing it doing it is because i'm leaning back with my upper body so once i start leaning back i'm pushing my hips up so that's the reason i always want to use my upper body to compensate or use it to influence how gravity works with the weight once the kettlebell is in the overhead top fixation and i'm going down the kettlebell drops, I'm lifting my heel off the floor again because I'm pushing my hip again to the top because I want to reconnect my arm. That's one reason. I want to reconnect my arm with my hip or my body as fast as possible because the hip takes the brunt of the weight. And the second reason why I do it is I'm leaning back again to compensate for the gravitational pull of gravity that pulls down the weight in a very in a straight line so that's the reason why i'm lifting off the heel but check out the video that has more detail now uh we recently did a mobility and warm-up video that all of you really liked it right you just typed it in the chat yesterday and, and it has a really <coughs> excuse me it, it uh it's it's it, it got a really nice welcome. It does really well, this mobility and warm-up video. Please check it out. It is a 25-minute video. I think we released it yesterday where we have a mobility and warm-up routine for beginners, an easy one, and, and a more advanced, which is more static, which requires in itself a little bit more mobility. So check it out. 25-minute video in a very, very cool detail, I believe. And better to the question is better to do it before or after training. I and then uh, this comment got an answer already. I love it when the community itself is is uh, answering questions. So uh, this person said, from what from what I've learned, you do a warm up in itself, a more dynamic one in the beginning, and mobility at the end. What I say, preference. But I have to say. Once you start lifting with weights, especially with the kettlebell, especially the ballistics, are predictable. You have to be able to move well with body weight only. So if you're not able to move well with body weight only, do some mobility work first. And even after, I'm, I'm telling you, when I'm showing stuff to our clients, I'm using a 16 only, 
only because once I go 20, 24, my body's responding like, bro, you're not even warm. You're not mobilized. And I even felt it. I tried to sew something with a 24 and it went like this and oh shit, that felt bad. So with the 16, I don't have to be warmed up, but let me tell you, every kettlebell workout, out, kettlebell workout I do, I always use my mobility routine to warm up and to get ready for the exercise and to get ready for the workout. Because I believe it's highly dangerous to go into a workout unprepared. It's like going to war without your weapons. So make sure you do, my opinion, mobility first. What you do afterwards is preference as well. I believe in just cooling down, relaxing, and then really uh, uh, um, getting your heart rate down. Just maybe if you want to stretch, do it. If you don't feel like stretching, don't do it. Because the idea, in my opinion, of stretching or mobilizing is the following. You want your body to be able to move as good as possible in order for the exercises you're doing as perfectly as possible and adapted and equipped for your anthropometrical situation for your you know the length of your forearms the length of your humerus your femur whatever and the way your your hips are positioned so that's what you do before you start the workout and once you're done i believe just resting regenerating recuperating is one of the most important things if you finish the workout and then you do a stretching routine and the next day you go balls to the walls again and you destroy yourself be, and even though your body is not fully recuperated yet rather than doing this i tell you you stop the workout don't stretch don't do anything take another day off and then go back at it again so you see what i'm saying it's always better to really regenerate and really take a break and let your body rest without you having to do without you having to actively do something so this was in response to when we were talking about the idea of balls to the walls training stefan loves this expression right when this no pain no gain mentality how i believe that this can be detrimental to your workout to your progress to muscle building to losing weight to whatever and so we got this comment. I think it was Yakub, right? He was saying, I was not able to gain any more weight because I pushed myself to the limit. After I switched my workout routines to your six minutes rounds, three to four rounds, two months ago, I gained two kilograms of meat. Awesome. So that's the minimum effective dose. And I was just recently talking to Angie how this really heavily, heavily influenced the way we structure our workouts, especially when we work out with clients in our personal training sessions. Because destroying yourself, especially for beginners, you want to get that feel, that sweet spot of, ooh, that was intense, I had to work hard, I had to push myself. Yet if you go above and beyond, it's maybe destructive. So really good to see that somebody said, listen, I always went too hard all in. And this, as you can see from this comment right here, it can even be detrimental to muscle growth. You think you're doing all in, you're going all out, you're really pushing your muscles to the limit, and then maybe don't, they don't adapt at all. So you see how, and it's rarely talked about, how important regeneration and re recuperating is, and how do you regenerate? Just do nothing. But once you get the habit of habit of working out people believe that they always have to work out that they always have to do everything and anything all day every day which i believe is not the case now this comment i got we got this comment in response to what i was saying the that i don't believe that alternating cleans with two kettlebells you know cleaning right then cleaning left it's even i think it's called the donkey kong even just or gorilla cleans or whatever, so many different, um, not a Donkey Kong, I think it's alternating snatches. Um, doing gorilla cleans, right? So many different expressions or uh, descriptions for exercises, yet it's the same, alternating double cleans. I think you get more cross-body stabilization core work when doing alternates, so double cleans is not a complete replacement. I do agree, however, when we talk about cross-body, or just, you know, working one side more and the other side less. Or one side is working 
more intense and the other side is resting, then why not do cleans with one kettlebell? Because you can just do basic cleans with one kettlebell with your right arm and then you always have this little you're always tilted a little bit to the side. So one side is always working a bit more, all right? And then you switch it. Or just doing clean with right, with you just do alternating cleans with one kettlebell and you get that vibe. And the other question is cross body, how important is it really? I probably just build a very strong core or a very strong foundation with my abdominals and my lower back and my obliques just doing Double cleans in itself, right? Interesting stuff. So two more, guys. Uh, no, last one. Yeah, that's the last one. Okay, how do you have a New York accent? Ha <laughs> ha, that's awesome. That was a cool question I got. How do you have a New York accent? New York City. <laughs> I think the reason why I sound a little bit more like New York is I listened when I was younger it's not kettlebell related now. It's more personal. When I was younger, I was following the passion of music for a very long time. And I listened to rap music. And I actually, this is, this is what I was doing. I printed out the lyrics from DMX, Nas, you name it. All, and that's New York style. Right? I, I was heavily influenced by New York rap, right? So I always, even though I listened to Tupac as well, I was more influenced on the New York uh, side of things, right? So that's probably where I got my accent from. <laughs> so I printed out the I printed out the lyrics and every word, you gotta imagine this is what I did. This is crazy now that I'm thinking about it. Every word that I didn't know, I underlined it, went back to the dictionary, and I looked at it. And there were so many slang terms in there that I didn't understand and they weren't in the dictionary. And now you have, I think it's what it's called, the slang dictionary, where you can check out slang words and understand their meaning. Urban, I think it's the urban dictionary, right? So that's what you could do then. But back then, it wasn't no urban dictionary. So I had to really underline and then think about it so and then i had to kind of make sense of the statement in itself or the rap in itself the verse in itself so this is probably where i got my accent from so guys i think that's it for the day, uh, the day. thank you so much for joining let's check out the chat guys are you guys still exploding are you guys are still going crazy in the chat we have 14 people in the chat and it's i think i've been streaming for one and a half hour already so guys, uh, let us show us some love. Uh, show some love in the in the comment sections. So we got uh, Dean saying, "I have recently changed my back swings to thumbs back all the time now, which seems to help avoid any elbow stress using heavy weights, especially for long duration reps. Feels much better. One hundred percent, Dean." I think when you use the, the, the swing or you go into a backswing, doesn't matter if it is the swing, the clean, or the snatch. However, when you use the back grip where your thumb is pointing back, coming down from a clean or from a snatch, it is harder to do a proper hand insertion once you have to turn and get back in the rack rest position or they don't want to have a top fixation, depending on what exercise we're talking about. So pointing your thumb back... The awesome thing about it is you actually relieve tension or you release tension from your forearm and your bicep. You have to imagine if I have, if I hold out my arm like this and now it goes down and it blocks right here, that's my hip, right? What the arm can do is it can still be able, it is still able to flex, right? So maybe the biceps get a, gets a little tension a little bit, but my... I have, I can, if I relax my arm completely, I'm just, it, it's like a, it's like a, um, it's like a hinge, tuck, tuck, and that's it. However, if you go into the backswing with your front grip, which can be useful as well, is here's my hip, boom, it's not able to flex, so the tension maybe even intensifies, and this can maybe tricky for your sinews and your ligaments, and not only your muscles and the bones as well. So that's pretty understandable. And I use the back grip now 
most of the time, 90% of the time. However, Angie is saying she has a better feel and a better vibe with the front grip, even when she's using heavier weights. So you see how interesting that stuff is. So the light just turned off. So I think that means that we're done for today, guys. Thank you so much for joining. Do we have some stuff in the in the chat? We got this. Uh, Dean saying you speak better English than half of the UK population. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Um, and here you go. Alexa saying the New York accent that's called accommodation. Probably yes. The Urban Dictionary. I'm a trans translator. And Derek, yeah, just recently joined. Yeah, you're from New York State, right? If you want a New York accent, just talk like you're really annoyed all the time. Trust me. <laughs> Got you, brother. So thank you so much for joining, guys. I hope we were able to serve you some value. So we'll catch you on the next one. Tomorrow is another live workout going down. Looking forward to see you guys there. Use those emojis. Use them as much as possible. It's for the Kettlebell Club. You can use these emojis, these new emojis with Gypsy and all that kind of stuff. It's just awesome. So catch you on the next one, guys. Like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, like the video and subscribe to the channel. Catch you on the next one. Peace out. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the stream, leave a like and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you want to see more kettlebell content and more live workouts. If you want to financially support our YouTube channel, you can join the Kettlebell Club. There's a join button right below this video. It'll cost you only $5.95 and you will be mentioned in our live streams. And you will get a small LS logo right next to your name whenever you comment something. So that way people will know that you belong to the tribe. If you want to take it a step even further and you want to work out from home without any ad breaks, you can check out our 30 days of kettlebells workout course. I'm clicking on my 30 days of kettlebells course. On your left hand corner, you have all the chapters and the lessons. All these workouts are divided into chapters and into lessons. Right here it says, welcome to 30 days of kettlebells. We have some important information, blah, blah. So then when you're ready, you can click on continue and boom, you're switching into your first workout and it already starts. So here you got your first workout. As you can see, when we scroll down, you can see here is the description for the workout. No ads, no ad break. Okay, it's just the workout and you. You see the exercises, you see what you have to do. 30 Days of Kettlebells is an intense workout program that builds you up as a beginner without prior knowledge. That's what we specialize in. From now on, you will receive one of the following tasks each day for the next 30 days. You have a workout. So if a car pops up that says workout, here you will be tasked to work out. Simple. If a car pops up that says rest on your day two you saw previously, we believe that regeneration is also as important as working out. On these days, you can rest. Then we move on, you have cards that pop up that say rest and study. You can rest and you can study a specific topic that we'll cover in this lesson. And finally, you have some cards that pop up that say rest or workout. What that means is you can either work out if you feel like it or you can take a break. It's only $49.99 so if you want to support us, if you want to support the channel, if you want to support our kettlebell courses and if you want to enjoy something ad free and learn something new and get a deeper understanding of the kettlebell and get a deep connection to us, then feel free to buy this course and have fun.